That's the truth. That's the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and gathers and dogs. play a little basketball, that's why we see it. I can hoop. <laughs> I can hoop. <laughs> nah, my, I got to admit, my game is a little broken at this point. <laughs> but, you know, I might, looking around, I'm, some of y'all I might take. <laughs> we was trying to have a little contest, who would take you on one-on-one. Yeah. Right, yeah. See who well, I'm there. just going to have you set a pick. <laughs> I'll be open the whole time. Be all the time. You got it. You got it there, Mr. President. You know, Mr. President, we thank you for coming at this moment. Um, because, as you know, with 13 days ago, very important election. Uh, you know about elections, and you know about Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, and the significance of, of this state, you know, what it can do. And you couldn't be a better person coming here in the heart of North Philadelphia. Not too long ago, you came to Robin Hood Dell. Not too far, you was there. You always been significant to us and and Philadelphia. So we want to thank you for all that you've done. And but what I like to do is start off with a person who has a question to you right now, Anthony Phillips. Anthony, this is your chance. Uh, Mr. President, I'm Anthony Phillips. I'm the executive director of Youth Action in Philadelphia, uh, which is a youth civic engagement organization. And also, I work in College Access with an organization called Team Sharp. Uh, I basically have been in youth development for many years now, working with young black men, young women, but m most particularly young black men. In a world where many young black men are derailed by economic and educational opportunities, many of them say to me, why should I care about the political, being politically engaged? Why should I care about being involved? Given our atmosphere, political and social atmosphere, why should young black men care to be engaged in the political process? Well, first of all, let me just say hello to everybody. Uh, and please give your organizations, your, you know, your families, uh, you know, churches, mosques, you know, your community. Uh, let them know that not only do I say hello, but Michelle says hello as well. And it is always great to be in Philadelphia, uh, in part because, you know, this reminds me of home back in Chicago. Right? When, I, when I see what's going on here, it's no different on the south side or the west side of Chicago. Uh, we're confronting the same challenges. Uh, I got my start in public life, doing some of the ki same kinds of things that many of you are doing working at the community level uh, as an organizer and you know eventually then went back to law school came back started doing civil rights law and voting rights law and that remains my baseline for why i got into politics to to help lift up communities that had for too long been ignored, that continued to deal with a legacy of discrimination, uh, and where I met too many young people, boys and girls, young men and young women, who uh, so often felt like they were on the outside looking in, and that the ladders of opportunity for them were being blocked. Uh, in all kinds of ways. So, uh, so this is where our heart is, and you know, when I come back to Philadelphia, I'm always reminded 
and this was true during my presidency, that you know, this is this is where I got started, and I never forgot that. And there are communities like this all across the United States. Now, you know what I what I consistently try to communicate during this year is particularly when I'm talking to young brothers who may be cynical about what can happen, is to acknowledge to them that government and voting alone isn't going to change everything. Because, you know, young people are sophisticated, so, so there's no point in overhyping what happens. Uh, you know, the truth is, is that I'm very proud of my presidency, but I didn't immediately solve systemic racism by virtue of me being president. We didn't uh, immediately lift everybody out of poverty or fix every school or uh, address every issue and impediment that was going on uh, in, a, in a community like this one. But what I always tell young people is we did make things better so that by virtue of me being the president or Eric Holder being the attorney general, we did change how the U.S. Attorney's Office operated so that uh, prosecutors weren't rewarded for throwing the book at somebody on a nonviolent drug charge, but instead we said, look, the guidelines are treat people proportionally. Don't, don't just assume that we want maximum sentences in every situation, because that may not always be the situation in which justice was served, which meant that there were thousands of cases, tens of thousands of cases that were dealt differently, and that made a difference for those young men's lives. We didn't immediately deal with all the health care issues in every community, but the Affordable Care Act provided 20 million people who didn't have health insurance some health insurance. And for those 20 million, some of them in Philadelphia, they may have gotten their lives saved or not been disabled or not had to give up their house to pay for a, a medical bill when somebody in their family got sick. You know, we may not have changed police practices in every state, but we were on the right side of these issues so that when a Ferguson happens, we're able to bring on a consent decree that says you have to clear with us before you do anything how you operate. Because we've seen in the past that you're not always operating in a way that upholds the rule of law and treating everybody with dignity and respect. So the answer for young people when I talk to them is not that voting makes everything perfect. It's that it makes things better. You are more likely to have representatives like the congressman or the senator who are going to look out for you, who understand who you are. Your voice through them will be heard in the corridors of power. And what that means is that when budgets are decided or policies are issued, that they are more likely to reflect your views and meet your interests. And that's worth spending 15 minutes to go vote. <laughs> yeah. We saw this summer amazing outpourings of, of folks on the streets from every different background. And it made me optimistic about young people because they want, what, what it showed me was that in some ways they believe more in what they were taught than maybe their teachers did about what America should look like. They took seriously the idea that people should be treated on the basis of the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And that we, that we want to have a, a, a society that's not discriminatory and, and to tear down some of those barriers. 
So there is room for protest. I come out of, I was inspired originally by a tradition of protests, including people like uh, my friend who, who left us this year, John Lewis. But protest that is not translated into policy, is not translated into law, it just kind of dissipates. It goes away. What we have to do is always constantly figure out how do we institutionalize awareness and make those into laws and policies that can actually change the country for the better. And that is worth 15 minutes. That's worth some time. You know, I, I was talking to a, a buddy of mine who's a personal trainer. He says, yeah, you know, I meet folks. Uh, they start off, they're supposed to be on a workout program. And, uh, you know, after about a month, they say, you know what, Th this isn't helping me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not looking <laughs> like the rock. <laughs> so, I, so I'm just going to quit working out. <laughs> Was I, and he tells him, he says, listen, you're never going to look like the rock. <laughs> but you can be healthier than you are right now. Yeah. Right, right. And you'll live longer and have a better quality of life and set a better example for your kids if, if you work out and eat better. Yeah. Right? Well, voting is a little bit like that. It, just by virtue of one single election, things don't become perfect but you get yourself on a pattern, on a habit of being better represented and getting better served by your government. And, and that's the message that we have to send young people. The easiest thing to do is just say, well, I quit. But we can't afford to quit. And, and as I said at John Lewis's uh, funeral, as I, as I have said right here in Philadelphia when I spoke at the Democratic National Convention. Our, our ancestors, our, our, our fathers, our, our grandfathers, our, they had a much better excuse to quit than we did. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how, how you, you think about what they were going up against when they started trying to register folks to vote, and, and you're, they're looking around and they're saying, it's not possible, anything's going to change. Jim Crow's been in place for... A hundred years. And yet somehow they still had the wherewithal to make a change. And, and, and look, you know, sometimes I hear folks talking about how things haven't changed. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> I mean, that's just not true. Anybody who says things haven't gotten better in this country is somebody who didn't live through the 50s. Or the 40s, mm -hmm. or the 30s. Mm -hmm. Because if you talk to folks who did, they ain't going to say nothing changed. And the reason things changed was because folks voted. That's how the Voting Rights Act got passed. That's how the Civil Rights Act got passed. Up and down the line. And that's going to continue to be how we bring about changes. So now, I, I have to say, while I'm working out, I've, I've, I'm still thinking someday maybe I'll look like the rock. <laughs> maybe if I shave my head. <laughs> All right, what else we got? Senator yeah. the street, you have a question. Yeah. Like well, this? I'm supposed to provide the overview. But, uh, Mr. President, you know, when we were here, we heard from business people um, like Daryl Thomas, who's here in the audience, and others who explained that as small, first, a lot of barbers and beauty salons did not get access to uh, the PPP dollars. Now, I'm in the state Senate. We're in my district. It's one of the poorest districts in the state, and I chair the Bank and Insurance Committee. And we know there's been a history of redlining, and those banks don't have the best track record with doing business with our community. And that was one of the concerns we heard. Other concerns we heard about the fact that there's not a lot that the federal government's doing about gun violence. Quite frankly, it's not a lot Pennsylvania state government's doing about it either. And people were concerned about that, and they're saying that it's not so much older brothers that are having trouble getting them engaged to vote, but it's younger brothers who haven't had the life experience that you or I or the congressman have had in terms of living life to see a little things. Those are the people who are trying to be concerned because their life is short 
And if you're 18, you were 14, you were just starting high school when this guy got in the air, and they don't, so they're not seeing the change. Um, and believe it or not, for some of them, you know, uh, 12 years ago, you were six when you got elected. And while that doesn't seem like a long time ago to us, to these younger people, it does. And so that was part of the conversation we were wrestling with. Uh, and I'm, supposed, I'm going to introduce now my imam. I'm the first Muslim senator in the state. And my imam, uh, Imam Idris Abdul, <coughs> Imam Idris Abdul Rahir, Zahir um, is here. And he's a younger guy. And I think he had a question for you specifically talking about a little bit of what's going on. Thank you, uh, Senator Street, and thank you, President, my forever president, President Obama. <laughs> Pleased to be here. Uh, yes, uh, Imam Idris Abdul Zahir, uh, resident imam of Master of the Law, the Center for Human Excellence. I'm also a, a uh, IT management professional in the area. Um, it's often said that, um, you know, uh, the difference between a good and great uh, vote, black voter turnout is, you know, a question of black male engagement, as we just discussed. So what do we think is the best way, uh, you know, to engage, uh, uh, you know, the black male vote, specifically in a city like Philadelphia, which has one of the largest, one of the nation's largest black Muslim populations? Well, look, first of all, a couple things I got to say. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, I, my first... Uh, political office was state senator. So I'm always a little biased <laughs> towards state senators because uh, it's a great experience, especially in a big state like Pennsylvania or Illinois, because it allows you to meet people from all different kinds of the state and form coalitions. And ultimately, that's how you end up mobilizing the power you need to bring about real change, right? So, uh, and it's part of the reason why I'm confident that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are going to be able to deliver on some of their promises because they know how to make coalitions. And, you know, I, I think it's important for us, anyone in the African American community, to recognize that although our problems are more acute than many other communities, there are people of all races, all faiths, in regions throughout this state and across the country that are also hurting. And those are potential allies and partners if we can get past the constant division that is fed, attempting to set ourselves apart. And that's been a long history in America, by the way, which is you, you try to distract working people from coming together to work together by highlighting racial differences or religious differences so that the people who got what they got can keep what they got. Uh, now, in, in terms of getting young people to vote, look, uh, you know, I, I've got two spectacular daughters who are about as well-informed and conscious and active as just about anybody, as you might imagine, they would be because They've got Michelle Obama's um, role model. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Michelle and I also joke, you know, sometimes they'll sit there and they're really sophisticated and, you know, making all these important points and, you know, showing what they've been studying around history and, and they, you know, they'll quote Frederick Douglass and Fannie Lou Hamer and, you know, you, you start thinking, wow, look, look. and then they'll do something that reminds you, oh, they're only 20, <laughs> right? Because they're young. A lot of the young men you speak of, it's not just that they're, uh, you know, African-American males. It's just they're, they're young, and young people have a lot of distractions. And they are, uh, it, it, it is rare, and I, I will confess that when I was 20 years old, I wasn't all that woke, because I had other stuff that I was 
I was interested in. We won't go into the details. <laughs> and, and so a lot of times, I think our uh, young men, they may try to give a rationale for why they're not active and involved, but the truth is they're not active and involved because they're young and they're distracted. And the way I think to, to break that, uh, that mindset, you know, if you look at every study of voting patterns, people vote when they see other people voting, when they see their peer group voting. So I think that the most important thing we can do in these closing 12, 13 days is for us all to model and advertise that it's the cool thing and the right thing to do to vote and to do it where they are, right? So um, I notice that my children, they don't watch TV that has advertising because they're streaming everything. Either it's on the phone, if they are watching TV, they've pre-recorded it, they're going through the, they're not, that's not a way to reach them, which means that uh, organizations like yours that already have contacts, let's take your mosque, for you to create something digitally that says, here's all the people that are going to vote, you know, we're, we're going to take a tally of who's already voted, we're going to have something maybe a mixer or something, but you got to have your voting sticker on, right? Whatever it is that meets them where they are, rather than expecting that they're going to be responding to the same kinds of things that a 50-year-old man might respond to. I think that's really important. And they have to see that their peers are voting. So trying to figure out how, I, I think, you know, uh, Joe and, and, and Kamala have done a good job in listing some validators and influencers on social media that they listen to. But a lot of times there are local folks that may not be, you know, as famous as uh, you, <laughs> Barack Obama. I want to. As me, yeah, right. <laughs> I wasn't going to say him, but, you know, like a Buster Rhymes, right? I'm get you. I'm you know, get Although even Bus is, Bus is almost my age. I, I don't know. You showing your age now. You talking about Buster, right, man? So, Come on. So, Mr. President, I think um, we have one of those young validators who's a, Coach uh, Isaiah Thomas, who's now a member of Philadelphia City Council, who's going to ask you a question. That's outstanding. Uh -huh. President, um, first of all, it's an honor uh, to be here with you, President Obama, and I'm pretty sure all the brothers who do the work um, on the ground in different aspects and different uh, ways in this city would agree with me that uh, we appreciate you engaging us in this dialogue this morning, uh, this afternoon at this point now. Um, but again, I'm Council Member Isaiah Thomas. I'm a Council Member at large here in the city of Philadelphia. And for us um, here in Philadelphia, we have a lot of everyday problems that are impacting people. And those problems existed long before the pandemic. But because of the coronavirus and because of the pandemic, those problems have been magnified. And so when we're encouraging people to go vote and we're pushing them to uh, go to the polls, of course, that there's uh, some level of resistance as it relates to um, how will this impact, this election impact my life? Can you help us and speak to us as it, to, as it relates to tools that we can use so that we can let people know? Similar to what you said earlier, the election will not all be won. Uh, I mean, sorry, all of our problems will not go away with one election. But at the same time, we have to recognize that this is a step in the direction of, of progress and change. So what would you say to a lot of us that's on the ground that sees and hears and gets this resistance on a consistent um, basis um, because of the pandemic and because of those problems that existed are now pretty much on steroids? Thank you, President Obama. Again, we appreciate you being here. Well, first of all, uh, how old are you, man? <laughs> I'm 36 now. You're 36. You seem like an extraordinary young man. You may not be old enough to know that Bulls fans generally don't like Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, want, I want you to watch The Last Dance in case you missed it. I it's did. on ESPN. I did. I did. 
<laughs> because <laughs> I mean, you know, so they got him on the East Coast. So yeah, you know. yeah no, <laughs> man. <I'm... laughs> Listen, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you because because seeing young talent, right? I, I think is what always gives me hope. Um, you're going to know your communities better than I do. One thing I would do is to, as much as possible, focus on concrete issues that will be affected not just by the presidency, but also down ballot. Now, let me take a couple of examples. The senator here was mentioning uh, that the emergency uh, federal stimulus package didn't reach a lot of black businesses. That is something that we're almost certainly going to have to uh, revisit. If it, does, it doesn't right now look like it may get done before the election, and who knows what may happen right after the election, but the economy is still in, in dire straits and small businesses are falling left and right. When you look at how that money was distributed, there weren't a lot of people who look like small business people in this community that were reached by it. So that's something concrete and specific that I, I feel confident you can promise, which is if Joe Biden is elected and Kamala Harris are elected, the next round of emergency spending by the federal government to help support small businesses is going to be structured so that it's more representative and every community benefits, not just some. And it's going to be small businesses and not just big corporations. I think it's also important to remind young people, though, that it's not just the president and the vice president that are on the ticket. So here in Pennsylvania, flipping the state legislature could then start dealing with issues like gun safety. Absolutely. You could then start looking at reforms around how the criminal justice system operates in this state. School funding. You know, how we think about uh, diversion programs for young people. Right? There are a whole host of issues that are going to be determined in this election, not just the presidential and the vice presidential race. And I think it's really important sometimes when we're talking to young people to listen to them, what is it that they're concerned about? You know, one of the, one of the things I learned when I, I first went to Chicago, I'm in the South Side, I'm ready to set the world on fire and, and go out there and organize. And I had been hired by a group of churches uh, who were dealing with many of the community problems that s still face a, uh, an area like this. And I was 10 years younger than you. I was 25. And uh, the guy who had hired me, he said, I want you to just spend the first month, I want you to just go around talking to people and listening to them to find out what it is that they care about. Because a lot of times we go around, instead of listening, we just want to tell people what they should care about. But we don't take the time to find out what do you care about. And I think, Councilman, in, in these last 12 days, you probably have a sense of some of the things they care about. But if I'm engaging a young person, the first thing I ask them is, well, what's an issue that's really important to you? And as soon as they say anything, <laughs> I guarantee you I can find something about that issue that's going to be impacted by this election. So then I can turn it around on them and I can say, oh, well, if you really care about this, let me be very specific about how this is impacted by what's happening in the state legislature, what's happening at the federal government, what's happening in terms of who the district attorney is or the state's attorney is, what's happening in terms of, uh, you know, how budgets work. Because ultimately, the, the, one, one of the biggest tricks that's perpetrated on the American people is this idea that the government is separate from you. The government's us. 
of, by, and for the people. It wasn't always for all of us, but the way it's designed, it works based on who's at the table. And if you do not vote, you are not at the table. And then, yes, then stuff is done to you. If you're at the table, then you're part of the solution. And, and, and I, I, I really want to emphasize to young people as much as possible, look, in 08, when I was elected, we had the highest African-American turnout in history. But it was still only about 60%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When people say voting doesn't make a difference, we've never tried what it would look like if it was 80% voting. Yeah. <laughs> or 90% voting. During midterm elections, we get 30% of people voting and probably 15% of young people voting. Well, you, you, you don't know if it's going to work if you don't try it. So with young people, what I, what, I, what I would say to them is, look, give this a shot. And if, because one thing I can say for certain is that after having been in office for eight years, the country was better than when I came into office. And I can show that by any measure. So yeah, voting worked. It didn't make everything perfect, but we solved a whole lot of problems. And the same is gonna be true here locally in Philadelphia. We, we can make things better. And better is good. And I always used to tell my staff, you know, nothing wrong with better. All right? Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate you. How am I doing on time here? I want Because I know they're going to, at some point, they're going to yank me because that's, yeah, that's, that's... I think they're telling me you got one more question. Ma can we get uh, Malcolm Kenyatta? I think they want uh, young brother, bulls. Rice. I'll take two. Okay. All right, they got two. Malcolm, and get, get Malcolm. And I'll bring up some of Young bulls. He's a state legislator. Young bull. Well, Malcolm, walk up there. And let me just say, if you don't think things have changed, Having a brother in the state legislature with that haircut, <laughs> Go ahead. that's a change. Yeah. It looks sharp, man. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, you know, they, you didn't see that 20 years ago. No. Well, well, I was saying my, my hairstylist thanks you, and she'll cut this video up and put it in half. <laughs> uh, that's but, good, man. Give, yeah. give a little props. But, but, but again, my, my name is State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta, and um, obviously thank you for everything you've done and continue to do. Um, your, when you ran for office, your slogan, hope and change, the last couple of years have been a lot of sadness and destruction. What still gives you hope? You know, um, when I sort of burst onto the national scene, it was, be, it was after I had won the nomination to be the U.S. Senator from Illinois, and I was invited to be the keynote at the Democratic National Convention in, in Boston. And uh, I talked about hope and the audacity of hope in that. And, and I made this point about hope, which was hope is not blind optimism. Hope is not ignoring problems. Hope is believing in the face of difficulty that we can overcome and get a better world. Hope is looking squarely at our challenges and our shortcomings and saying, despite that, I think through effort and will and community, we can make things better. And so... I've never lost hope over these last four years. I've been mad. I've been frustrated. But I haven't lost hope. And the reason is, is because I never expected progress to move directly in a straight line. If you look at the history of this country, you, you make progress and then there's some 
backpedaling and backlash. And, you know, you, you, you consolidate some victories and then there's some slippage and then you get a, a renewed surge of energy and then you make some more progress and then there's a little bit of backstepping and then you push again. And I think what we've seen over the last four years was <laughs> a, in, with, with my election, I think we had probably gotten over optimistic about how much change had happened in the country, but that change was real. There was some pushback and that was real too. But when we started seeing all these young people from across the country demonstrating this summer, it reminded you that they, they internalized that sense of optimism and change and possibility. So what gives me optimism is when I see them, I say, okay, here we are. Back to make another push. People like you. People like the councilman. You guys are out there and you're going to push it to the next phase. And then you're not going to get 100% of what we need. And there will be some disappointments and areas where you fall short and then it'll go back a little bit and then you push forward again. So I... One of the benefits of age is realizing that uh, in, in any endeavor, there are going to be setbacks, there are going to be uh, times where you fall short, there are going to be people who are opposed to trying to do the right thing. And the test of our strength as a people is our ability to push through that on through to the next stage. And, and I, I have never given up that sense of we are resilient and strong enough to push through what we've seen in these last four years. Now, the question is making sure that we understand we can't afford another four years of this because what, what happens is you do get to a point where you go so far backwards that it becomes really hard then to dig yourself out of that hole. And, and, and I'm so confident in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris surrounding themselves with people who are serious, who know what they're doing, who are representative of all people, not just some people, and us being able to then dig ourselves out of this hole, and we're in a deep one. You know, you, you talk about, let's say, the pandemic. The pandemic would have been tough for any president. I mean, this is a, we haven't seen something like this for 100 years. But the degree of incompetence and misinformation, the number of people who might not have died had we just done the basics, the degree to which it has impacted low-income communities so disproportionately. That's something that I'm, I'm, not just com I'm not just confident that it can be fixed. There's proof. Canada, right across the border. You've got 39% fewer deaths. Almost 40%. I, 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 I mean, we have examples. So, so I, knowing Joe as well as I do, knowing Kamala as well as I do, knowing the people that they're advising them, I know we will be able to deal with this pandemic more effectively. It doesn't mean that it's all going to be solved tomorrow. We're still going to have some struggles, but I know we can do better. And, and that's what gives me confidence. That's what gives me hope. But we're going to have to vote in order for that to happen. So, All right. Last question. Last one. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President.
Now I was supposed to introduce you and tell me. <laughs> no, go, go ahead. He can, he can introduce himself. <laughs> he, he works he, with your wife. He doesn't need a hype man. You know, <laughs> this DJ Khaled here. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> What's your name, man? Mr. President, my name is Tamir Harper, and I will say I'm probably the youngest person in this room at 20 years old uh, mm -hmm. from Southwest Philly. And my question is kind of two parts, but all in one is how would you uh, tell an educator, as I want to be a future black male educator, how would you tell an educator to have a curriculum around voting and the importance of voting specifically during this election with only just about a week and a half left. But also, how would you uh, kind of get young people to have many different intersectionalities at the table and involved in elections? Well, first of all, did, did, uh, did the senator say you worked with Michelle? <laughs> I took, uh, I was with First Lady Michelle Obama during college signing day. Fantastic. All right. Um, look, we, we're going to have a big task ahead of us in providing a better education curriculum on citizenship. And, you know, we could have a long conversation about part of the problem in our schools the degree to which we teach kids from, you know, these worksheets and stuff that has no reference to the lives around them, instead of teaching them based on their experience and what is right in front of them, right? So, you know, they're reading about stuff that has nothing to do with what they're seeing, words, you know, that has have no correspondence to uh, their lived experience. So, so that's a longer conversation, but I, it's never too early to start with young people and explaining to them what I just said earlier, which is the government is you. That in the same way that when you go out with your friends and you got to make a decision about what pizza you're going to get and is it going to be cheese or pepperoni or that you all decide if there are 10 of you or five of you, you go, well, let's say we'll take a vote because we can only afford one pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you guys are exercising self-government. And here's the history of what's happened, which is that it used to be only a few people got to make the decisions for everybody. And because of people worked hard and they struggled and they voted and they fought for the right to vote, more and more people got a seat at the table and more and more people were able to have some say. And we've still got more work to do. And here are all, that's something that a, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, can understand. And part of the job, I think, for an educational curriculum is to give them actual experiences voting. It, there's interesting. Studies show that people are more likely to vote if they've participated in something like that when they were younger. So finding excuses to say, hey, uh, you know, what kind of posters do we want up in the rooms? Here's, here's some options. Let's all vote. You know, what, 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 uh, here are three books that I want us to read this semester. Uh, which one do y'all want to read first? Put up, giving people, a, giving kids a sense that they have a voice, that piques their interest. We teach kids the opposite, which is just do what I told you to do. Shut up, right? I don't have to explain why, that's how we're gonna do it. Well, if, if that's our message, then that carries over to when they're adults. And they start thinking, well, I, you know, I, I have no say over this, I have no power over this. So I think as much as what the curriculum is, creating models, to give young people experiences, it, and it doesn't have to be student council or something, because like, I, I wasn't a member of student council. 
I had those distractions I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm very proud of young people who were part of Super <laughs> um, but, but creating opportunities for young people to collectively make decisions. And, and to see that the decisions they make then create results and have consequences. That's, I think, more than anything what we want to teach people. We, so much of our world is designed to teach people to just consume and, and watch and eat and just lay back instead of teaching them to produce and make and create. And we do that across the board. That's, that's why when I see schools that like eliminate art programming or music programs, that's a terrible thing. Because one of the things about programs like that is they spur people to think, oh, I, can, I don't just have to listen to music, I can make music. I don't have to just go to a museum and that's art. No, art is me drawing something. And the same is true when it comes to civic in involvement. It's like show them that they can do it and give them examples of it. Um, and, and, and that requires us to have faith in our young people. You, you, you know, I, I think so often, particularly in, in communities where we're hurting, that we, we want to protect them, but then what that means is we make them afraid of everything and 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 what we want to do is just say no 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 the, the, the world is there for you to shape uh, and give them opportunities even in small ways to do that and 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 when that happens you'll be surprised they they, they will rise to the challenge all right well listen I I appreciate all you guys I got to get out of here I got to go do a rally You know, th th 